Hi and welcome back to PDA Dad UK. In this episode I'm going to be looking at the complexities of mental health and why it can sometimes feel like everything seems to be fine and yet we can still struggle with our mental health. As I say, welcome back to PDA Dad UK. Before we go on, please do go hit like, hit subscribe and ring the bell. You'll always know when new content's coming up, but you'll also be helping me hit that 10K mark for subscribers. It would be a huge milestone for me, so please do go do that. It's a huge help. As I say, in this episode, I want to look at the complexities of mental health, and this is something that's often played on my mind. I've had periods where my mental health has struggled. I've shared that on this channel before. Uh, I'm not a depressive personality, but there are times where life has just got on top of me and I've, I've hit that dip. And why is it that that happens and it seems to creep up on you? I don't know if you've experienced that, but it seems like you, you kind of wake up and you think, oh, I'm, I'm really struggling. And you realize there's been a, a decline over time, but you don't know where it all started and how it happened. I see it with my family as well, especially with my daughter. She can suddenly be really struggling and you think everything seems to be going great. There's, there's no real issues at the moment. So why are we suddenly hitting this barrier? This all started because of a seminar I did the other day. It was run by a group called Young Minds. And Young Minds are a charity that look at mental health and um, neurodivergence within young people and how they can support and help that. And I got invited to this thing and it was really good. A lot of it was stuff that I already kind of, I, I knew and had dealt with in, in the role that I do. But there was one particular piece that really stood out to me and it was a, a different way of viewing mental health and our mental health and the mental health of those around us. I don't know about you, but I've always viewed mental health kind of like a roller coaster, if you like. For this example, I think I'm going to use a sound wave because it will fit with what we're going to talk about. But if you think of a sound wave, it flows and ebbs. And you get that's kind of like how a, a mental health can be. It goes up, it goes down, and we see peaks and we see troughs. That is how life works. But why do we get to those peaks and troughs? And what they introduced was this concept of a sound desk. So for those of you who, who are listening who are musicians or uh, work in that area, you'll understand this, but it's actually a really good concept regardless of who you are or what your experience is. We've all seen a mixing desk. So it's the big block there and it's got all the dials and you, you see it in movies and all that kind of stuff. And it's where the adjustments made that you get the sound right. So there's bass, there's treble, there's your uh, mid tones, there's all those different elements that go into a soundboard and you get it so it's tweaked right. On there, you'll sort of, people often mark out the, the sweet spot. So we know this is where the treble needs to be. This We know where the bass needs to be here. It's like a big, if you like, a big graphic equaliser for those who are <laughs> around for the days when you had the big stereos with the fancy graphic equalisers on them. And you find your sweet spot and you, and you set it up. And there's like a little green zone where it's, it's good in that zone. But if your veer's too high, mids are a big one for me, actually. When I, I play guitar, I'm a musician. We've, we've discussed that before. Mids, if they're too high, it can really ruin the tone. You can see playing and you think there's something not quite right here. It doesn't sound quite right. And I generally find that's where the mid tones are. If the treble's too high, the same sort of thing. And if you have the bass too high and the treble too low, then it all sounds a bit muffled and muted. You kind of, you've got to work a way that it sounds right for your ear. And it has a big effect on how you play. In the same way, we all have these settings within us. And they can be your sleep. How are you sleeping? They can be your anxiety. Are you feeling particularly anxious about something at the moment? Has there been a stressor in your life at the moment? Is there something that is just, you know, there's a stress dial basically, and it can go up and down and different people will have different green zones for that. For some people it will be a very small green zone that they can only, you know, deal with so much stress before it becomes too much. Other people have a bigger capacity and that green zone can increase. It basically runs into that one of these things can just shift off. So I was talking with Chris Lee Smith, who's one of the grumpy gets, and we were talking about these concepts and, and how fascinating it is. And the thing he said is that it's funny because, you know, I'm loving life at the moment, but there's just one little thing that's, that's playing on my mind. Went to go to sleep last night and it was just playing in my I couldn't turn it off. So there's one little stressor that just went up too much and it's triggered something. But the knock-on effect was that his sleep is now affected. So that sleep dial starts getting affected. So the fact that he's stressing about something that's, you know, relatively insignificant has just knocked it not far off, just enough that it's affecting his ability to turn off his mind and get to sleep properly. When you have less sleep, you get grumpier. You wake up tired. So your tiredness level is then being affected. And that ability to cope with stress, that green zone reduces. Does that make sense? When, you, when you're in a stress state, when you're tired, when you haven't enough sleep, your ability to cope with stress 
reduces. So that green zone becomes less. And if you're already off kilter on it, it then amplifies that and the effect to other things. And that can affect your relationships. If you're grumpy, you're not realizing, but you might take it out. You might just be short with your answers. And that affects those around you. And they can become affected. That in turn comes back on you. And you're, why are they so grumpy? And it creates this pattern that just starts to develop where everything's thrown off. I found this really fascinating because I've always looked at it as being this single sound wave. And we have our peaks and troughs. When I started realizing basically because of this that there is an element there that one thing affects another then it can really really start to play in and affect everything else and suddenly you're in a dip because your whole soundboard has gone off it's all in the wrong place and it can be really difficult to then go back and start amending the things to get yourself into a good mental health space i experienced this I, I, i've talked about it before you know uh, a good few years ago I, I started to relive some stuff from my childhood and it was only in small ways to start with you know just little memories that would creep in and issues that i hadn't dealt with with certain people in my life and relationships that were damaged and in need of repair because of it so that relationships doll just started going off kilter for me but also that stress dial was starting to go off kilter because it was playing on my mind it was stressing me what do I do about this and you start thinking about you know what could I have done differently what could they have done differently my anger started going up because you feel the sense of injustice my frustration started going up because if I felt helpless in the situation that started keeping me up at night I wasn't sleeping great because every time I led down to go to sleep my brain decides that's the time I'm going to process every bad thing in your life and that we're going to think about it right now so you're trying to get to sleep and this stuff's playing over in your head so I was getting less sleep so my ability to cope with that stress and that anxiety that was coming because of this and the relationships they were all getting thrown off kilter as well it was a period of time that I really, I went into a really dark place and I ended up seeking therapy. I basically went and saw my GP and he put me on some mild antidepressants and logged me in to get some support from therapy. And I was humming and hurrying about it. There's, I think sometimes therapy can be overused and, you know, that's certainly how I felt then. My, my opinions have changed considerably <laughs> over time, being the, uh, you know, the experiences of my life and, and where I with family and stuff like that. But I, uh, I, I went for the therapy because I, wanted, I needed to help myself. I, uh, at this point, I wasn't married. I didn't have kids. I was just in a low place and this was, this was for me. There were a number of things that came out of that. One of them was the... Uh, my self-talk was abysmal. So I don't know if you're familiar with self-talk, but it's like another little dial on that mixing desk. My self-talk was very negative. All I saw was the bad in me. And I've, I've spoken to a number of people over time who they kind of relate to this. It's very hard to see the good in yourself because you know all those negative things about yourself. And I don't know about you, but my brain loves to remind me of my failures and not my successes. It reminds me of the things I've done wrong, the mistakes I've made. I'll replay conversations I had when I was seven and somebody was upset and you're thinking, why did I say that? I can see how upset they were now. And it all reflects, and this is what was really happening, was all these conversations and, and things that had happened in childhood were sort of starting to surface. My brain was ready to deal with them, but it threw everything off. And he started getting on to me about my self-talk. So he started with, you know, he obviously looked at the, at the mixing desk and he'd identified a couple of things that I could start working on right away. Let's get them back into the right zone. And self-talk was a big one. And it was, you need to, you know, talk to some friends, get some positive input. And a really good friend of mine, who's my best man, and we've interviewed him on this channel, Alan Smith. And he said to me, the problem you've got, Dunk, is that you see your bad and you don't see any of the things that the rest of us see. You only see your failures. You only see the mistakes you've made. You don't see all these amazing things. And he went on to list a whole bunch of stuff. And it was, talk about an ego boost. It was really, wow, that is, you know, thank you. I walked away feeling really positive. My self-talk started to improve. So I started to be able to put that into a, a healthy place. Once I got through that moment, once or that, that period, once I got through understanding that my self-talk, I needed to improve how I saw myself, that allowed me to start dealing with the relationships in a more positive way rather than just being either blaming or blaming myself i was able to start rationalizing and seeing oh, these things were wrong but this is where we are now what can i do to fix it now how can i amend these things now 
that then allowed me to start sleeping better at night because I was resolving these issues and I was doing some positive actions. I was feeling better about myself. So as a result, I started to sleep that little bit better combined with the, you know, the mild antidepressants that I was on. It was all helping me process this stuff. So my sleep started to improve. Once my sleep had started to improve, it actually empowered me to be able to deal with those other things in my life because I was able to relate to it in a much more healthy way. I was able to see it in a much healthier self view and I was able to see it from a much healthier view of how others were involved. It, it really impressed me and I started to look at it from the perspective of my family. And so my daughter's mental health, my daughter's mental health is different to my own. As I say, I'm a neurotypical. I don't have a depressive personality. That was a period of time where things were really hard. And we all hit those times, every one of us, I think. A very rare a person that hasn't been through some difficult times in their life and has hit, you know, the rock bottom point. For my daughter, though, her mixing desk is totally different to mine because she's neurodivergent. Where my ability to cope with anxiety has a wider green zone, for my daughter, it's much narrower. The reason is, is that her anxiety, we've discussed this before, the central, you know, part of being autistic it comes back to this knowledge of anxiety and that she just has a higher level of anxiety that's always there you know there's not much room left on the dial if you like it's always up fairly high anyway so her green zone's really really small if the anxiety increases too much it instantly throws everything off kilter so for her it only takes something small it only takes a small adjustment in her life and that anxiety is really affected so if she's got a stressor and it could be something very simple. It could just be that she's lost her headphones. This happened the other day. She couldn't find her headphones and it really started upsetting her. That's because that instantly affected her anxiety. But because there's so little room to move with the anxiety, she couldn't manage it. And so the ability to deal with stress was then reduced again. So her green zone reduced in that, that little uh, that, that slider and she wasn't able to cope with it. That then dealt with, you know, the, the ability to, you know, the self-control aspect, I guess, the ability to maintain an equilibrium and not overreact. So her relationship thing really went downhill because she couldn't deal with anybody else around her. So the relationships were becoming shut off. She was struggling to sleep. It seems to be something that really happens that, you know, when she's stressed, that's what really does affect. She can't sleep because, again, these things are just playing over her mind. Her anxiety is that high that it's leading over to the sleep thing. It all has this knock-on effect, and it's not necessarily something that just happens instantly. This can happen gradually over time, just small increments. That stress one particularly, we can be sitting quiet, and we can have a decent green zone in our stress slider. But it starts edging up, it starts edging up, and over time, it just starts edging up a bit more. All these other things are being affected by it, so our, it might just be a little thing, and, oh, I've got to do that tomorrow. You might get to sleep fairly quickly, but it might just edge up a bit more. Something else may come in edge up a little bit more and suddenly you're not sleeping effectively and it follows through to all these other things. I just found it such an interesting metaphor and a really good example of how to view things and it's helped me because I can now take a step back and look at what what are the, what are the stresses in this environment, what's happened that's putting this. So she lost her headphones. So instantly I could go, okay, so her anxiety is high because she's lost her headphones. She needs them to self-regulate. She likes to put the headphones on, listen to music. It shuts off the rest of the world. Really helps with her sensory processing side of things. So she she needed her headphones. So seeing the overreaction, it was like, okay, well, let's, let's go and look for your headphones. Let's see where we can find them. Turns out they were in the car door. So she left them in the car because she'd be listening in the car. And we were able to find them. And that instantly brought that anxiety bit down because she was worried, not just that she lost her headphones, but she knew if she can't use her headphones, she's going to find it harder to self-regulate. So it's creating another level of anxiety. And, you know, it's often not a rational thing. And it's not something that she was even aware she was thinking. All she was thinking is, where are my headphones? I want my headphones. I need my headphones now. The brain in the background is processing all this stuff. So being able to go, just in that very simple example, Let's go look for your headphones. Found them. Here they go. It allowed the, the dials, the, the sliders to move back to their better positions. You know, sleep's a big one, I think. And sometimes we just don't sleep well for whatever reason. It might not even be a stress thing. It could just be that maybe you had coffee too late in the day and you're, you're buzzing a bit at night. Maybe, you know, I get it. Sometimes I just lie there and I just can't get to sleep. And it's not because I've got anything particularly playing over in my mind. My brain is just not tired and it's, it's not letting me get to that point where I need to fall asleep. For my daughter, melatonin isn't produced naturally. She has to take melatonin. So for a long time, she couldn't sleep at all. She was, you know, very, very badly, only when her body really, really crashed because her body wasn't producing that natural hormone that allowed her to go to sleep. 
and it really affects her so that 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 really set the board off because she's not sleeping properly so the anxiety the ability to deal with anxiety is reduced the ability to deal with stress is reduced the ability to deal with relationships is reduced and her green zones were diminishing everywhere and everything was going off kilter the other thing with the sliders that i found really interesting this was sort of something i was thinking on afterwards is that they go up and down and i realized this for my daughter especially we talked about this we've got this emotional cup inside us and it can only take so much emotion and that emotion can be positive or it can be negative and for most of us it fills and it empties as the day goes on when things are too much that's when it all boils over that's what causes meltdowns essentially so for my daughter her cup's nearly always full i need to take something very small and it all comes overflowing because her anxiety slider is really high but the thing with that that cup that holds our emotions if you like is that it can be positive and negative emotions it can be filled with really exciting stuff christmas is a really good example because christmas is so much fun there's so much exciting stuff going on it's so much reason to be celebrating and it creates this you know big full of you know the emotional cup which means that she's even less able to deal with the the other stuff and meltdowns become more frequent because christmas is such a sensory explosion in her mind i, I found it fascinating to think from that perspective that with the sliders, they can go up and they can go down. So it might be that your anxiety is full, but maybe your, your, your emotional slider is going up and it's edging out of your green zone simply because good things are happening and you're really excited. But it's then having that effect on all these other sliders as well. So it doesn't have to be a negative thing. It can be really positive things that are in our life. Our sliders are somewhere in the middle. They're not all at the top. They're not all at the bottom. They, they, they sit. In a, in, a, in a place where they're right. It's just here, just here. When good things can happen and we get excited, that can increase our emotional slider. That can push it up or it can, you know, where it would come down if you're feeling really low. Maybe your emotional, it slides down. If your emotion's really high, it's still pushing it out of that green zone. She's still knocking onto the ability to deal with stress or, uh, you know, all these kind of things. Again, really excited. Who sleeps when they're excited? Very few people. It's like, oh, tomorrow's the day. You know, you see kids on the day before their birthday, they can't sleep. They're up at 4 a.m. That's what they do. Mental health is really important. If you're struggling with mental health, there are a load of charities that can help. I will put links in the description to uh, a lot of charities that can help with mental health. And I'll put Young Minds in there as well because they were fantastic. And it was a really good uh, seminar that I sat through for that. Please do go hit like, hit subscribe and ring the bell. You'll always know when new content's coming on. Moreover, if you've got any experiences with this, if you struggle with mental health, if it's something that you want to share, if there's questions you've got about this, please do chuck them in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. It makes a big difference to uh, how this all gets received as well. So please do go chuck a thumbs up in the, uh, the comments as well. I will see you again on the next episode. In the meantime, please do stay safe.